Are you guys pumped about the the Mars landing today? I, I'm personally pretty pumped about it. It's, it's happening. Uh, I think I'm I'm teaching like right before it, but I think it's happening at um. Three no. Two fifty five, three fifty five. I can't remember. Um, yeah, three fifty five. Today you can watch it like on NASA TV. It's landing, but there's an eleven minute light delay, so it'd probably be at four oh six or something. The actual landing. So I check it out. Um, yep. Yeah. So uh, that's and the, that's three fifty five Eastern time, I should say. So uh, that that would be. <clears throat> For, for the folks in China, that's going to be in the middle of the night. So that, that maybe is a little bit more of a investment there. Okay. Um, all right. So then I think we can get started. Uh, any outstanding questions before we start moving? No? You ready to go? All right. Cool. Um, okay. So last time we were doing these graphs. I always enjoy these graphs personally. I think they're fun. Um, and they're, they're kind of cool because you can actually like kind of figure out real stuff from them. I think you can, I mean, you, you don't get the numbers, but you can kind of figure out where you're going and roughly qualitatively how you get there. Um, and then like, you can even do like policy changes and stuff like that. It's, it's sort of like a, it's a puzzle in a way, but it's not like, too hard, you know? It's like Sudoku, but it's easier than Sudoku, I think. So um, yeah, so that, so I think those are cool. Uh, but we also need to step, there. there are one or two things that I wanted to, step back and talk about, okay? And I was thinking, um, you know, the, it, maybe you've seen it going through the slides, okay, so there's stuff about the budget constraints and stuff like that. So it's a little heavy, but I, I actually realized that there's a, probably, there's an intuitive way to go through it, which I think is much more useful than just like, hey, this is a differential equation, let's brute force, double integrate it and, and solve it, okay? So um, I'm gonna do the intuitive approach and then like if you wanna go through and, and work out the, the, like the full, um, algebraic approach, then that's that's cool too. All right, so um, let's see. So jump ahead, boom. All right, so the, the, the stuff I'm talking about is is basically starting. You know, when we define the but when we figure out what what is the budget equation, okay, and that thing. Uh, this basically is what we're going to be working with, okay, for the most part. This this equation here, um, and then so then what we say is well, okay, well we we can think about this non-autonomous version of the differential equation stuff we were doing. And you know, technically there's a solution where we just have these like sort of like wild double integral that's going on here. And we can apply that to this, wherein M is equal to R minus N and B is equal to C minus or W minus C. Okay, so we could do that and just plug in everything and, and we'd get the right answer, right? Um, and that this is the answer basically. If you do that, you end up getting something like this, okay? But I wanted to go through a little bit just how, you know, why is that, okay? Um, it won't take too long, but but I think it'll be um, instructive and then we'll jump back to the, the graphing stuff later on. Well, actually, then we need to do a little bit with the transversality condition and then we'll do the graphing stuff, okay? That might be the whole class, but we'll see. All right, so, um, okay, so then let's think about this budget equation. Okay, so here, um, I'm jumping over to the to the iPad here. So, um, all right. So let's just write down what we're working with. This is our budget equation. R minus n times a plus w minus c. Okay. So you, w is good. Wait, getting more money is good. So that means your assets go up. C is is bad for assets. You're spending it, so you're not saving it. That's how I remember it. Okay. So, um, okay. So that's and there's a t on everything here, basically, except for n. Okay, and the equal sign in the parentheses. Those are those are not time varying. Okay, so um, but but in, anything reasonable is going to have a of t uh, attached to it. Okay, now um, the question is, okay, so we're gonna we this is a, a per period budget equation, and we want to turn this into what's called a lifetime budget equation. So we want to think basically it's the integral form. If you remember when we did that stuff with like uh, the optimality conditions, rho mu minus mu dot equals h x, and then we turn that into an integral. This is actually roughly the same thing because it's just like something times a minus a dot right if you think about r minus n times a minus a dot should be equal to c minus w is that right yeah that's right okay so um 
Yeah, so so but but here you have this differential form, okay, which looks a lot like uh, you know, some discount rate type thing times our object of interest minus it minus its derivative equals some kind of flow. And this flow is um let me make sure that that's right. Is that right? That's right. Okay, so this flow is sort of like how much you're spending in excess of your wage. Okay, you're you're cons you're consuming C. Your wage is W. If this is positive, you're kind of overspending. If it's negative, you're underspending. Okay, and so then it, what it should indicate is that A is sort of like the accumulation of all that over or underspending. Okay. Um, Although I mean I would think that I think A is the accumulation of your underspending, right? If you if you're if you're saving, you're you're spending less than your wage, and that's accumulating in A over time. So that's why I keep thinking there's some kind of minus sign missing here. But maybe it's just a I think it's just like a, a boundary condition thing. Okay, um, but we'll we'll work through it. Okay, so um, but the basic idea here is is. Uh, what I was just saying is that you know the A is just your accumulation of your underspending, okay? Um, and so we we can actually just think about it like you know if you and, and so you're underspending you're you're not throwing away money right? So if you underspend you put it in the bank. You, so you're either consuming or you're saving. You're not just burning money or uh, I don't know what else people would do with money right? So um, you're you're either saving or spending. So any when you're when uh, C is below W that means A should be going up. And when you put money in the bank, it earns the rate of return R, or kind of like R minus N here in this case. Okay, so um, so that's what's going on. And so you can think about, if, if you want to think about what is A of T, okay, so first let's, let's, um, let's do the case where R is fixed, okay? R of T, having R actually varying doesn't break what we're going to do here. It just adds in a little bit of nuance, but we're going to do that fixed R case first and then just sort of add on the end what happens when you do time bearing R. Okay, it's, it's basically the same thing though. Okay. Um, all right, so, so what is A of T? Okay, well, so it's going to be, you know, if, if you put money in the bank at time zero, that's going to grow at rate R. Okay. Um, sorry, I've got. Got hair issues here. Uh, that's going to go at rate R. If you put money in the bank at time one, that's going to go at rate R, but it's going to start doing so at time one. Okay. So we're thinking at T, your asset position is a retrospective accounting of everything you put in, in the bank, and you just have to know when did you put it in the bank, um, and then how much has it grown since then, right? So it's going to be like um, the integral from zero to T. So here I'm thinking it, the the inner inner grand whatever the integral variable is how far back in time you're look you're thinking okay so your zero is today t is t actually time zero okay so it's a little backwards but we'll see how it works in a second um and so how much okay so first of all how much are you gonna well, let me let me let me not put the cart ahead of the horse here first of all you, you put in a certain amount of money in the bank at some time period okay which we're going to call S, okay? So that would be uh, right, this should this is how much money you put in the bank at time S. Your wage minus consumption, right? So if you didn't consume anything, you just put your whole wage in the bank, right? Which would be weird, but you could do it, I suppose. Um, so so that's how much you put in the bank, okay? And that might be a negative too, because I'm saying put in the bank. When I say put in the bank, I either mean literally put in the bank or pay down your debt. Which is like, you know. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's how much you put in the bank there. That's going to have grown though in the interim, and uh, let's see. So it's going to be t minus s amount of time. Okay, so if you if if you think about this exponential here, at when s is equal to t, is this right? Let me think. Or no, maybe it's just S. Oh, it's gonna be S. All right, so. Is that right? Uh, okay, so the S equals zero. No. S equals zero is today. So then it should, yeah, okay, and then S equals T will mean it'll have grown by T. Okay, so this should be, I think this is right. Let me 
Is that... Let me just see if that comports with what I have in the, the notes here. I think that's right. Okay. Um, yeah. So this will this will give you, you know, at and maybe it, maybe it's because I I defined s sort of backwards. I'm not sure. But this will give you, you know, if you put something in the bank at time zero, it'll grow, uh, you know, e to the tr basically up until time t. If you put something in the bank at time t, okay, where s equals zero here, then it won't have grown at all because you just put it in the bank. Okay, and this will accumulate everything. Now, there's one additional factor, which is well, you you also start with a certain amount of assets technically, right? So you're going to have an a zero. So you're going to have a zero, okay, and that's actually going to have grown at rate e to the rt. Okay, we've got some lag here. Um, let me. Uh, Pretty substantial, right? You're not seeing you don't see anything with a zero yet, do you? No. Okay. All right. Let me uh, shut that down for a second. Okay. All right. And then how's that looking? Okay, that's not so bad. Um, hopefully it doesn't accumulate. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is going to be this would be how you would accumulate um, your uh, your assets over time. Okay, um, right. So you just have some initial position, which is just sort of in the bank, and that's growing. Okay, and then you're adding to that uh, uh, over. You know, you're adding to that through the ways in which you're spending less than you actually make. Okay, so when when W when C is less than W. Okay, and vice versa. All right, so that's that's gonna that that basically gives you an A of T. Okay, and then if you think about um, let me see, uh, I'm just trying to square this. I had I had this whole intuitive thing keyed up, but now I feel like I'm missing a term. Let me just think for a second here to, in the exponential that I'm getting this right. Um, so what I have in the what I have in the slides here, I think is is actually sorry. Right here is a t minus s. I'm trying to figure out why would that be. Um, okay, I know why. It's this because I, I was trying to do things backwards. Okay, so the question is: Is s how far back you're looking, or is s actually literally in time? Okay, and the way I have it on the on the iPad right here is that s is how. What's well, actually just wrong, basically. Okay, so S, let's just say S is time. Okay, so if you put something in the bank at time zero, where S equals zero, okay, then the, it should have grown at a uh, factor e to the tr. Okay, if you put it in the bank at time zero, at time t, it should have grown by e to the tr. Okay, and so really what I should have here, which is kind of what I was about to put in the beginning, was then I second guess myself, it was, was something like this. Okay, and this should be this should be actually correct. Okay, so so the idea is you if you put it in, now in at time zero, it's going to grow at t minus s, so just t basically times r exponentiated. Okay, if you put it in at time t, s equals t. Just get my mouse up here. If you put in s equals t, this is going to evaluate to e to the zero, so one, which means it won't have grown at all because you just put it in the bank. Okay, so I got I got confused about the definition of s there. Okay, so this should be. This is basically what we should have: is that you you uh, integrate over time how much you're putting in the bank, and just make sure you you get the right um, interest rate uh, uh, time period there uh, to th so it's growing over time, okay? Um, and then your initial assets just grow, okay? Now it doesn't matter because it's like linear; it doesn't matter like your initial assets. You know, you might if you start with some a zero, right? And let's say it's high for whatever reason, and then you're um, you're actually spending down out of that, so you're consuming more than your wage. 
but that you're you're supporting that with your assets. You're you are you know you're taking ADR out of the bank, and so you might say that this then sh this wouldn't have an RT here or like this whole uh, asset position wouldn't be growing because you took some out out of the bank. But that's going to be accounted for in here actually. So it kind of all works out because of something like linearity. Okay. Um, so in the sense that you could have not spent that A0, right? And and done something different with your spending path, okay? So this is, um, yeah, so this this would be A of T, okay? Now, and this is this is actually, yeah, so now this corresponds to what we have in the slides, although the slides has time varying R, okay? So this is just for constant R. Um, and so this will tell you for a given wage path, okay, assuming a fixed R, uh, and a given consumption path, how are your assets going to evolve over time? And it's really just a matter of how often is C greater than W or vice versa, and what was your initial asset position, okay? Now, okay, so that's good, and this is now we've gone, and you can you can verify also, I guess I should say, that the uh, that this equation, the original equation, is, is equivalent to that, that integral form, okay? Um, and essentially, the reason for that is you, you get kind of a Leibniz rule thing, okay? You guys, remember, you guys remember Leibniz's rule? For if you take a derivative with respect to the uh, bound of an integral, okay? You just get the value of the integral at that point because you're, you're just shaving off a little bit of that integral, okay? So, um, yeah, so in this case, when you take the derivative here, you're gonna pick up a Leibniz rule and the Leibniz rule always, when you're when you take the derivative with respect to t, it's going to plug in a t for the s here, which means that this exponential disappears, and you just get whatever is in here without any exponential. When you take that derivative, which is going to give you this w minus c, and then the the other part where you look where you pick up this t inside the integral is going to give you an r. Okay, so here I, I'm 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 I've equated r and r minus n because I didn't feel like writing r minus n. Okay, so so this r is just like whatever r is there. Just pretend like it's r minus n. Okay, I, it it just adds a bunch of parentheses and it's annoying. Okay, so so you get that you get that r whatever the effective growth rate is. Okay, um, that's gonna pop out here because it's a, it's an exponential, right? When you take it over with respect to this t, you know this is just integrand stuff. You're gonna pop out an r times the whole integral again. Okay, so you're gonna get the whole integral. This comes from Leibniz's rule. Okay, and so that that'll give you this. Um, And what about that? Mm. Oh no, yeah, so, and this, this also is gonna pop off an R, okay? But it's gonna factor out, okay? It's gonna factor out such that that's included in this A, okay? So I don't know, it, I could write it out. I'm gonna leave this as an exercise, okay? Just show, you know, showing that this in, this uh, integral form is equivalent to the differential form. It's just basically you're gonna get a Leibniz rule and you're gonna get like a pure exponential proportional uh, uh, factor, and that's gonna give you exactly that that original differential equation. That's the budget constraint, okay? Um, okay, so this is this is all well and good. Um, it's not 100% what we were looking for because we're looking for this. We're looking for the lifetime, what's called the lifetime budget equation. Okay, which is which is the sort of I don't know full you know integral form of, of our budget equation. Okay, this will tell us the path. Okay, the lifetime budget equation is really just an equation overall. Okay, for a, a kind of that's not a function of t basically. Okay, so this this is telling us for any any t. Okay, um, and uh, well, how can we do that? Um, well. Uh, we, we're gonna take this equation a of t and bring it off to infinity, basically. Okay, and and so it's gonna encompass all time, and it's gonna tell us that it's gonna give us a relationship between kind of a zero and the full path of c and w. Okay. Um, all right. So now here there is a little bit of a wrinkle, which is for this. Um, let's see. For this to be kind of well defined, we need to we need to rule out extreme paths okay for a of t okay this is kind of like um i guess this, this would be kind of like a, related to the no ponzi condition okay um we need to rule out extreme paths for a of t okay because um 
it could be uh let's see well it could be that a is going to infinity all right that's possible okay if um if you're making uh wages continuously okay and you're not spending all of them you could just a could go to infinity and that's not a problem okay what we want to rule out is a going to infinity way too fast okay in this case going to infinity faster than r okay which would if a goes to infinity faster than r that means your your present value of your assets evaluated at time zero would be infinite make sense right so if you want to value something t periods in the future you're going to throw on an e to the minus r t okay but if a is going if a is growing faster than r just the present value just at that time is becoming infinite, okay? Which is which means your whole present value is gonna be infinite. So that, that seems problematic, okay? So, um, and kind of the way, uh, the way we can think about that is take this equation, okay? And just divide both sides by e to the minus rt, okay? So a of t, e to the minus rt. And so each of these terms on the right has an e to the rt, and it's and it can be factored out because remember this t is not involved with the t is not s right so s is stuck inside the integral t we can factor that out okay so that's going to cancel okay and so this is just going to be e to the minus s r ds plus a zero okay so that's what we get when we, we factor out that e to the rt move it to the other side okay. So this is where we're gonna invoke that assumption that A is not growing faster than R, and we're gonna take the limit as T goes to infinity. Okay, so we take that limit, utilize that A is growing slower than R, which means the left-hand side is zero, right? That exponential is gonna kill off A of T, um, even if it's growing exponentially, but at a rate slower than R. Uh, remember this is zero to T, okay? So that integral now is zero to infinity, okay? Um, and then this is W of S, C of S, E to the minus, let's, let's call this now, um, let's just call it RT. So it, I could put S, right? And actually I have put S already, so let's change that. But we don't, we don't have a, a double, we don't have an internal integral anymore, so we can just make this a T, okay? So now it's just WT minus CT, there, e to the minus rt dt, cool, and then we have this a0. All right, okay, so that's that's it, all right? So we took the limit, we just had to, to make an assumption about the path of a, and then we get this equation that's kind of nicer, okay? Um, and then the final kind of form that we're you know, usually, I think about it as, is you could say, well, that means that a0 equals that whole integral, minus that whole integral, okay, which means we just, swap the positions of C and W, okay? All right, so this is if you just rearrange it, okay? So what does this mean? Well, this essentially says, okay, you start with A0. Could be zero, I guess it could be negative. You could have some, I don't know, that's, that's not exactly like legal in, in the US, in modern US where you can owe like money at birth, um, I think, um, but maybe it's possible. Or maybe you have no money, maybe you have a trust fund, I don't care. And you have that initial amount of A and you can spend it, right? And it, 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 your initial A determines how far you can live beyond your, your income means over your lifetime, okay? If your initial A is zero, okay, then that just means that the integral of C e to the minus RT equals the integral of W of T e to the minus RT. If you just if A was zero, you could just do a C equals W with, with the integral still there, which just means the present value of C, your path of C equals the present value of your path of W, which is like a, a reasonable, like you start, you start with zero, you have some, you have some present value wage that you, you expect to have, the present value of your, your consumption stream should be equal to that, okay? Um, a, all, all the, the, the difference basically is just that A lets you exceed that if you want. Uh, uh, over, over the lifetime, okay? It doesn't say how it's distributed. I mean, you know, these are front-loaded, back-loaded, whatever, but it says over your lifetime, that's that's the constraint. Okay, so that's why it's a lifetime budget equation. Um, yeah, and you, you can, you know, you could uh, phrase it in a more like, 
mm, non-differential sense where you could say, okay, well, this means that like, um, you know, the inner the integral of CT, blah, 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 is equal to A0 plus the integral of WT, blah, 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 right? So, so this would be saying, okay, the present value of your consumption stream is equal to your initial asset position plus the present value of your wage stream. Okay, so that's that makes more sense, and in some sense there is an appeal to that. Uh, you could you could write it like that too. Okay. Um, all right, so that's the present value budget equation. All right, that'll. Um, I don't know. I mean, that doesn't. What does it get us? It, yeah, it gets us stuff. Uh, let me think. It, it it's useful if if you want to go through and characterize exactly what C of T and A of T look like, okay, um, later on, okay, so I think, and so this is, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's useful in terms of interpreting things, okay, just interpreting what, what, is, what exactly are these constraints, okay, and what are some of the assumptions, right, that we made above that you need to make sort of implicitly to, for things to be finite, basically, and well-defined, um, but then it's also useful later on, okay, so let's see, so that, ah, right, so now, that's that was for fixed r. I forgot about the time varying r. So the time varying r, okay. Um, there's sort of a trick which is very useful, a notational trick, which lets you do this very easily. Okay, which is you define the bar is too high. Uh, you define r bar of t like this. Okay, I think I have this in the notes. Um, R bar of t uh, as the average cumulative interest rate over the first t. Well, it's continuous time, so it's not clear what first t means, but from the zero to t time interval, okay, of R of t. So this is just an average, right? One over t times the integral. Um, it's the average. Now, the cool thing about this is um, think about in the fixed case. If you, what, if you think about for a fixed R, what's the derivative of RT with respect to T? Well, it's just it's just R, right? We know how to do that. Okay, don't, don't overthink it. Um, so that's cool. Now, if you think about with this new R bar technology, what's the derivative of R bar of T times T? Right, what's that derivative? Okay, when we're, when we're taking derivatives up top, we, we were implicitly doing this. And, and now what's that derivative? Well. R bar of t times t is just this the integral part of what we have here, right? R, it's basically just moving this t over. It's just that integral part. And when you take the derivative, wait a minute. Sorry, I should, these should be s's, okay? So we're, we're taking derivative from zero to t, but the integral part should be yeah, s. Um, so we take this derivative, it's just Leibniz's rule. Right, the derivative of r bar times t with respect to t is just this. You're going to pick up a line that's rules here, here, so you'll just get r of t. Okay, so the derivative of that thing, r bar times t, is still just like r of t. Okay, now it's time varying, but it, it doesn't pick up the, the stuff in the past. It just picks up off that most recent slice. Okay, and so for this reason, if, if, you, if you go through and use r bar of t, you can you can just rep, you can just put but bars on everything I have here with this properly defined notation, and I think everything will be exactly the same. Just put a bar and and also of t, okay. And when you take derivatives and stuff, it's just going to pop off an r of t, which isn't going to cause any issues, okay. And it'll all work out, okay. So I'm not going to go through it, you know, again. But essentially, you can use this trick, and it'll be it'll be your friend, okay. And it'll make things easy you just kind of have to remember you know when, when you're and okay and so I should I should say how does this work and so so when you when you now when you discount stuff or when you talk about how is it growing over a particular time interval you're going to look at um, the integral of r bar of t times t okay all right of, of some you know whatever it may be w of uh, T minus uh, C of T or something like that. Okay, so, or S or whatever. So so you, you're gonna look at something like this. And so what this is saying, for for constant R, R bar is just a constant R. This is just the standard, you know, it's growing because you put it in the bank, okay? 
for time varying r, what it's saying is, okay, you put it in the bank at time zero. There was some stream of interest rates. How do you accumulate that? Turns out you do it linearly. Is that at time zero, the interest rate was R of t, you get a little return. At time one, I'm going to discrete, but you get the idea. At time one, r bar r was equal to r of one. It grew up you know, appropriately. So that variation, it turns out, is kind of just linear, okay? There's, it's not like you have to like aggregate them with some elasticity or square things. You know, you just take the average interest rate that was experienced over that time interval, exponentiate with, with regards to that, and it gives you like the right answer, okay? Um, so so that's, that's an intuitive argument, okay? I'm just sort of asserting that. If you go back and do the, the original, you know, brute force mathematical approach that I talked about at the beginning, you'll get the same, you get that answer, okay? You'll prove basically what I'm saying about how to aggregate these interest rates. But, so if you wanna do that, and if that gives you more um, confidence in these results, go for it. Um, and you'll see that this, this R bar just pops out, okay? This, this convenient notation just pops out, okay? Um, so it's good, you can, you can save yourself from writing multiply nested integrals if you just start out with an R bar, okay? Those get confusing because you got S. Sometimes you got something inside the S. It's like, what do you use after S? I don't even know. I mean, like, you need to come up with another letter. One of the hardest problems in mathematics, I think, coming up with letters. Um, so, it, you know, it, it'll, it'll save you some grief, all right? Okay, so that's, that's time-varying R, okay? Um, I'm arguing that it's... it's uh, you can you can basically solve it with with clever notation, okay, and it'll give you a very similar looking answer, okay. Um, so yeah, so the I guess I should say so like what the the final answer that you get, which is what basically what I have in the notes, is you know you get a zero is this integral from zero infinity c of t w of t here, and then you have did I yeah so you have e to the minus R bar of t. Let's let's throw in n just to get it like actually correct. Okay, so this if you use the the R bar trick, okay, you're just going to get that R bar, and I threw in the n just for good measure. Okay, so remember up. Can can we up here? Right, yeah, I think we can mostly make it fit. Up here we have you know uh, e to the minus r t. The same same everything else is the same. All I'm doing is put in a bar here. And also adding in the end at the same time, confusingly. Okay, but but it's really just you change the bar and that's the new answer. Okay, you add the bar of t and that's the new answer. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, all right. So that's that's that. Um, that's the lifetime budget equation. Um, so now we want to we want to think about let's let's bring this up and, and think about what does it imply for for like the solution to Ramsey. And everything like that okay and how is that useful all right so let's um okay so so we're going back to ramsey world okay we were kind of in ramsey world but now we're, we're going to like solving it okay so remember you know ramsey uh that hamiltonian right looked like this Okay, so that, that was, remember that was our Hamiltonian. Okay, I, I'm going to go through the just the, the solving method because it, it, it's like five lines of, of algebra, anyways, and it's something you want to basically know by heart. Okay, so um, you know, sort of condition one, HC equals zero. Okay, the derivative of that Hamiltonian with respect to C equals zero. In this case, that that means that you know U prime of C minus mu equals zero which means that you know, mu equals u prime of c, okay? And that's like a for all t kind of thing. Okay, so that's like our standard first order condition, optimally choosing the consumption path given the path from mu, okay? Um, okay, uh, and then the second one is, oh, it like, you know, um, oops. So remember, it's easy to forget about N, right, so remember our discount rate is rho minus n, so that's what we're going to put on the front of uh, the mu equation here, and this should be equal to h a, right, which is equal to uh, r minus n times mu. Okay. 
uh, at the end of the page here. So, um, all right. And so then in that case, you see this dynamic where the uh, the n times mu will cancel. There's one on each side. Okay. And so then you just get like um, I don't know, mu dot is equal to rho minus r times mu. Okay. So that's um, yeah. Okay. So that those are sort of you know you, these two conditions. Okay. You're gonna get some stuff kind of involving mu and c, and, and not a explicitly, but kind of implicitly, okay? Um, and, and we just want to eliminate mu, okay? And so, yeah, so in this case, uh, you know, this, this equation on the bottom, just one more line here, you know, th this implies, you know, for instance, that mu dot over mu, let's say minus mu dot over mu, we'll see why in a second, is going to be equal to r minus rho. So this really tells us something specific about the growth rate of mu at the end of the day. Okay. Um, all right. And the idea is for eliminating mu is that okay. So this 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 here tells us what when one answer for the growth rate of mu. Okay. And then from this equation, we can get also another answer for the growth rate of mu. Okay. Um, and, and I mean, really, um, yeah, so if you, if you, if you want to do it direct, I mean, we could just directly say, what is minus mu dot over mu? Okay. It's going to be minus u double prime C times C dot from the chain rule, right? Don't want to forget about that, uh, over u prime of C. Okay. Um, all right, now I've run out of room. Okay, but uh, we're gonna jump to the next page. Um, now, so that, okay, so, well, let me, it's always tough when you, you box yourself into the corner. Okay, so let's let's say we had this, right? And we had, um, I don't know, we had mu dot is equal to, let me just double check here, what is mu dot equal to? Rho minus r over mu. Okay, so let's do this in a non super constrained way. Okay, so what we did was say, okay, well, minus mu dot over mu, okay, is gonna be r minus rho. Okay, that was what we did before. And, uh, and then on the top, we say that minus mu dot over mu is equal to u, or minus mu double prime of c times c dot over u prime of c. Okay, so, all right, so then these two things, the top and the bottom are, are also gonna be equal to each other, and that's kind of how we eliminate mu, okay? Now the other thing with with the top and the bottom is when you do this when you do this things in term this in terms of growth rates okay on the left you have the growth rate of mu on the right you have a c dot but it's not a growth rate okay um, so uh, you know and you have something that's almost that elasticity of of marginal utility but not quite because we don't have an extra c so essentially on the on the that top line we're going to multiply and divide by c. And we're going to get this, right? So we had the c dot, but now we've multiplied and divided by c, put one into the uh, u prime and u double prime related terms to make that actual. This is now the elasticity, right? That's epsilon u, okay, including the minus. Um, and then this is just gc, right? So so we, by doing that, we we've turn this thing, which is just like a ratio of random stuff into the product of two things that we know pretty well what they, they sort of signify. Okay, so that's useful. All right, and so that, but at the end of the day also, we have this equality between these two. Okay, so we're gonna have R minus rho is equal to epsilon u times basically GC. I'll call it GC, okay? All right, so that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, in a sense, right? Um, it, it's a simple equation, it relates four things that we kind of are, are interesting in and of themselves, right? The growth rate of consumption, the elasticity of utility, the pure discount rate, and the interest rate, okay? Oftentimes people write it like R is equal to rho plus epsilon u times gc, okay? So it's 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 actually, and this is, this is the Euler equation. What people often, one of many hundreds probably of Euler equations, but this is an Euler equation, okay? Um, and so, this is cool because uh, you know R and GC are basically things that we can observe in the data, okay? 
bro and epsilon u are things that you could you could feasibly infer from micro level data, right? You could say, okay, how how what does people's marginal utility look like by looking at their response to uh, unexpected uh, income or tax base changes and stuff like that, um, uh, or you could also look at risky situations, although we don't have risk. That also depends on the marginal utility of income for in the Bernoulli sense. Um, and then row, I mean, you just look at do it, you know, give people intertemporal choices and see how they how they make choices, and and you can try to infer their discount rate from that. Okay, you know, like hundred dollars in the future versus ten dollars today, whatever. Okay, so this is stuff you can basically infer or observe. Okay. And then you can ev evaluate this equation and you're like, oh man, does it hold? And like, it turns out it doesn't really hold that well, okay? Um, just purely because this is a simple model, okay? And so the you know, real world's much more complicated. People are credit constrained and stuff like that. And so this isn't gonna hold if you look at kind of like data necessarily. It, it, not that it's a totally useless equation, okay? But uh, it is kind of interesting that it, cre it gives you a very stark prediction and relationship between all these things. But but also it's it's coming from a very simple model at this point, okay? And so it it's not so it's too much to expect that it's going to hold exactly, okay? So um, a, a lot of it is because of the, the credit constraints, I think. Um, basically, credit constraints. Um, sort of this kind of relates to the permanent income hypothesis about how much people anticipate things, okay? So um, there's a lot going on there. Um, but but that's our Euler equation, okay? Um, all right, so. We originally we wanted to talk about how to, how is this lifetime budget equation useful, okay? And for that, okay, so, well, so, I mean, we, we're going to use this basically, okay? Because I, I've been writing GC here, okay? But really, you know, this is, you know, GC is C dot over C, right? This is notational, right? Um, and according to that Euler equation above, it's going to be R minus rho over epsilon. Okay? So just rearranging it once again and using C dot over C, okay? So what this means, okay, uh, this means that uh, C, this, this tells us our path for C basically, okay? Um, and actually, uh, this implies, so, so, uh, that left the left hand side, C over C. Remember the growth rate is the derivative of the log, right? So this that C dot over C is equal to D log of C DT, right? If we take and, and there, there's an of T inside. So if we take the derivative of the log of C, it's one over C, but the chain rule also gives us a D C D T. Because that's a C of it's really a C of T inside. Okay? So so you know these this is just true mathematically. That those two being equal, okay, and then and I'll rewrite what we know that's be equal to, okay, of t, you know, on the r, okay, so so that's that's going to be true now, um, and and of course this has a c inside, which is also a function of t, so so there this isn't a clean, you know, log of c equals derivative equals something that we can necessarily. We can integrate it, but it's 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 not going to give us like a C of T equals something. Now, if we have CRA, well, then it actually is going to give us a C of T equals something with with C on the left side and non C stuff on the right side, right? Because if we're not in CRA land, this C is still spoiling the party. Okay, we could integrate this, right? I mean, we can we can always integrate it, but but if we integrate it. In the general setting, we're going to get log of c of t equals some integral, and inside there is also going to be c through the epsilon. Okay, but if we have CRA, where epsilon u is just a constant theta, that breaks that c dependence. Okay, so then we can get really a, a log of c of t equals something. Okay, all right. So let's let's do that. Okay, so let's say that this is r minus rho over theta. Now we still have. The R still can be a function of T, okay? And so, uh, yeah, so then we can integrate that log of C. So then we're going to get log of C of T is, um, well, it's going to be, 
the initial value, log of c of 0, plus uh, the integral here uh, from 0 to t. So this is actually, yeah. So from 0 to t, the integral of r of s minus rho over theta ds. OK, so, so we're integrate the right-hand side thing. We just integrate that. OK, I kind of did the boundary condition in one fell swoop. So if, if t is 0, this thing is 0. And so you get c of log of c of 0 equals log of c of 0. OK, so I kind of infer that the boundary condition is just going to be an additive. Uh, the initial condition, rather, is just going to be this, this log of c0 here. OK, so in general, I'd write you know, some constant equals this integral, then set c of 0 to, to match up with that, and then we're going to get this in, in the end. OK, so, so this is going to be our c equation. We just have this the log of something, and we integrate it. OK, now. This is very simple when r is constant, okay? Because this just turns into r minus rho over theta times t, okay? Because r is not necessarily constant, it's it, it's actually an integral, okay? We have to do that. But we can also use uh, we can use our r bar technology notation, if you will. Technology makes it sound very grandiose, which I'm going to stick with, okay? So um, how do we do that? So it turns out that this integral is just mathematically equal to this. Um, turns out that that's true. Okay, because <clears throat> we kind of work backwards. R bar of t times t is equal to this integral. Right, that's what we saw before from the definition of r bar. When you when you have r bar times t, it's just the the pure integral, not the average. Okay, this stuff. Okay, so the integral you know, we could have done this integral before. The minus rho part over theta is just going to get give you a minus rho over theta times t, which is what we have here. So the the r bar thing is just kind of like it happens that you can just put a bar and kill off the integral. It's just mathematically equivalent. Okay, so that's kind of why it's useful notation, is that it simplifies things and you can just kind of jump. You know, once you kind of get the hang of it, you can just jump down and say, okay, well, this is that 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 average kind of, okay, and so we can just turn this into an R bar and everything kind of factors out nicely, okay? So this is, you know, go back and double check this, but basically we can convert this into an R bar expression too, all right? So that's cool, all right? Um, we're still in log space, okay, which maybe is not ideal, okay, but we can, we can fix that too, all right? So uh, now let's simplify a little bit, okay? So first, you know, these are logs, okay? So if we subtract them and combine them, we're gonna get a ratio, all right? And then here we're gonna have r bar of t minus rho or theta, okay, times t, all right? And then we can exponentiate, okay? So, so at the end of the day, we're gonna get an actual equation saying, okay, c of, let's exponentiate and move the c0 back. So c t equals c zero times e to the r bar t minus rho over theta times t. Okay, so that's that's what we're gonna get. All right, we get a path, you know, some c zero, and then it grows off and grows according to whatever the interest rate path is. All right. Now, remember when we saw the steady state? Much when we solved steady state in Ramsey last time, right, with the graph and everything and the you know, the stationarity. We found that r of t would be equal to uh, rho. R star was equal to rho. Okay, so now if you think about, okay, you converge to steady state. R r r of t converges to some to to rho. Okay, now what's going to happen to r bar? Okay, so you have the initial fluctuations. Eventually, you converge to r of t equals rho. Because of the way you're averaging it, that average is also going to converge to rho eventually, right? That that initial flux, the initial fluctuations will will be negligible in, at infinity, okay? And so that's going to converge to rho too, and so that means that. Um, actually, wait. I'll more exponent. Let me let me think. No, I'm not so sure of that. Uh, 
No. Okay. So no, because if if the initial if the initial fluctuations were negligible, then I guess this would be equal to c zero, which would be problematic. Um, maybe they're not. Okay, but you're going to converge to something. Okay. You're gonna you know our our bar is going to converge. Okay, and then uh, c of t is going to converge to c star. Okay. What's not going to happen is it's it's not going to explode. Okay, it's going to converge to some fixed constant. All right. Um, let me think about that statement for a second, just to make sure I didn't say it wrong. I think that's right. okay. Yeah, I mean it's not going to explode in the end because we saw in the steady state that you converge to some fixed c. Okay, so um, all right. So now, how can we use this? So, so that I think I finally got to the point where we can actually use, or at least talk about using the, the lifetime budget equation because now we have c of t, right? And uh, and so remember the budget equation, you, we'd be taking this c of t, integrating it again, which sounds fun. Uh, plugging it in, and then we have W, T, and then I make sure that everything is, is consistent. Okay, so that's that's pretty heavy, all right? Um, so I'm gonna just jump to the slides and show you like, here's what would happen if we did that, okay? Um, okay, so here you can see at the bottom, that's exactly what we derived, right? Uh, with the R bar. And then on the next page, here's, you know, essentially I'm just saying, okay, this is what we had found for the lifetime budget equation with that R bar in there too. That's just from, from the previous slide. And then you, so you can plug in C of T. So it's it's nice because with CRA, you plug in C of T and it's some exponent, it's C of zero times some exponential, right? The exponential is gonna, uh, you know, the E to the, this E to the R, R bar minus rho over theta, that exponential term of times T is gonna combine with the R bar minus N term, okay? Those are all going to combine, and then you can integrate that cleanly. Okay, so because because it's exponentially growing, the exponential growth combines with the discounting, and you can actually do a, a proper symbolic integral. Okay, and then solve for c zero, and you, you can actually so you can just solve for c zero. C zero. C zero was the only thing we didn't know. That's true in graph world, and that's true still now because we got c of t conditional on that c zero starting point. Plug it into the lifetime budget equation. Really, the only thing we don't know at that point, which we can solve for, is c zero. So, so there's a lot of there's a couple steps, obviously, in between these two lines, but you can eventually solve for c zero, and you get something. I mean, it's it's a function of a complex, potentially complex path of wages and interest rates, but you get something for c zero, and you can actually say this is what uh, the prediction of the model is. Okay, so that's nice. I mean, when you step out of CRA, then you can't get this nice closed form solution, but in CRA world, you can fully characterize what's going on there. Okay, so that's, I think, kind of neat. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I don't know, that's, 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 that's what you can do, all right? Okay, so now the last thing, that old transversality condition, okay? Um, which, maybe I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna talk about it, okay, um, a bit, all right? Okay, so the, but the transversality condition, uh, Oh, okay. So let me let me jump over the slides here. That's a very long word. Okay, condition. Boom. Is what it's going to say that the limit as t goes to an infinity of the properly discounted value of our assets should be zero. That's our transversality condition, okay? Now, let me think about this. Uh, We know, okay, so we, we're gonna have an idea of the path of mu, okay? Um, all 
I didn't, did I? I don't think I showed up for it, but, okay. Let's jump back here. So, you know, through this whole rigmarole here, we eventually found the path of C, right? Now we could have done the same thing from mu, essentially starting here, okay? You can kind of do the same thing from mu because it's like, uh, you know, the, the derivative of the log of mu is equal to some function t, integrate it, and you're gonna get some, you know, thing, all right? So, and, we, and in particular, what you're gonna, you know, so, so we, we know that, um, From up top, basically we have mu dot over mu is minus r minus rho. Okay, is that, that's right. Um, yeah, so it's minus, just get my minus signs right here. Minus r minus rho, okay. So then, uh, you know, d log of mu dt is minus r minus rho, okay. And so then mu of t, well, going through those same steps that we went through before, it's gonna look kind of the same. It's gonna be harbor of t minus rho times t. Okay, so I did a couple different steps there at the end, but but just exactly the same things we did with c, integrating the log, you know, combining terms using the R-bar trick, okay? You're gonna get that same thing, and that growth rate is gonna be, essentially, you, know, you can kind of see this just from an exponential standpoint. Mu is going to be some have initial value some mu zero, and it's going to be growing exponentially, whatever uh, our r minus rho rate. Okay. Um, the only wrinkle is the r bar stuff. Okay, so um, that's good. Okay, and we can plug that in, and um, and you can see if we plug that in, let's just plug it in here. Okay. Um, well, so there, there's going to be a, when we plug in for this mu t, there's going to be a plus e to the rho t here, minus, this is a minus here, minus rho. There's going to be a minus e to the rho t here. Okay, so those are going to cancel. All right, and so what we're left with is e to the minus r bar of t minus n times t and then a of t zero okay all right so then what does that mean okay so uh, this is this is our transversality condition we're still in a space okay we can then uh, impose all that market clearing stuff. All right, so th this is in, this is still in like the consumer's optimization world. Okay, but the question is, once we have market clearing, A equals K, R is equal to uh, F prime of K, right, and stuff like that, right? Once and which is going to be what um, that's going to be the important part in the limit, right? So in the limit, we're we're wondering, where, you know, where do we end up? Okay, so um, okay, so well, so. We, we can show that, okay, well, first of all, we're gonna be able to show when you converge to steady state that this thing holds, okay? But we're also gonna use this to rule out certain paths in that picture we drew before, okay? Because um, essentially, K, it, we're, we're kind of constrained already with K. K, K. K cannot go to infinity, okay? Because it's it's, it's produced, you know, through the this uh, investment technology. It simply cannot go to infinity, all right, because of the depreciation. Okay, um, so that's so a itself is sort of already bounded. The the real question is this this exponential term, okay, and, and really because we don't have to worry about a, uh, all we need is that r bar of t uh, is greater than n. We got some lag here. But what I just wrote was, let's see how, maybe I should restart it again. We're getting to the point where I should restart it again. Um, so, but, okay, so what we're gonna need is that the term inside that exponential, r bar minus n, is gonna be positive, right? So that the exponential disappears in the limit, okay? Um, 
and that that's good enough basically all right so let's reconnect here yeah there we go so um so what we're gonna do that turns positive so r bar of t is greater than n or you know like the limit of it, it, basically it's good enough for the limit as t goes to infinity of r of t to be greater than n because if, if t converges to something greater than n and the limit then r bar should eventually converge to that too um and so we'll get that all right so um that's good enough. Now, remember what we found in steady state, right? We found r equals rho, right? R star, if you want, the limit. Okay, so this is like the, let's call this like the limit, whatever. So it's the limit, steady state, depending on where we end up, right? So in steady state, we found that r star was equal to rho, and that's exactly our assumption that rho is greater than n, right? So that our, our utility exists, right? So that remember our effective discount rate is, is rho minus n. So we need to assume that rho is greater than n in any case. Okay, so we don't need to make additional assumptions as long as our, our initial sort of anodyne assumption about the discount rate relative to the population growth is is holds, then our transversality condition itself also holds. Okay. Um so that's good. Uh and, and so it's not something that we need additional things that on the parameter space to impose, it's just sort of always true. Okay. Now, uh, when we, yeah, so then we'll see later on, okay, uh, that this also will help us rule out one particular funky path in the graphical space. Okay. So maybe we, we could probably just do that now. All right. So um, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So let's jump to the slides. Okay. So remember, um, or I could actually use my own picture if I want. Look, I'm gonna use my own picture just from before. Okay, so here, remember this is where we drew all those, we, we, we defined this KC space. We drew the K, C equals zero vertical line and the K equals zero curve, okay? And that broke things into quadrants and then each quadrant has a direction. Okay, and so the idea is that if this is a, what's called a saddle path, right? If you're an imagine horse saddle, right? It's gonna goes up in one direction, but then down in the other. So here on the diagonal components, it's, it's think about this as a, a terrain wherein your direction is defined by the slope. Right? So you're just rolling around. Okay, um, so down here, this would be like high elevation here. This would be high elevation, and then going down towards steady state. But then this is even lower elevation on these off diagonals. So you'd roll down. So if, if you were to roll around on this hill up or stay from here, maybe you'd go near steady state, but eventually you'd kind of veer off. Okay, that's that instability. All right. So um Okay, so now remember we, we had all these paths, right? And it's thinking, where do we start in terms of C0? If you start here, and, and the critical thing about drawing these paths is okay, you start somewhere, you need to uh, respect the directional law right there and you need to also make sure that when you cross these boundaries that you're moving either vertically in the case of the red line or horizontally in the case of the green line so that you ensure that you're respecting the directional uh, laws okay so here are these these high ones are easy you, you turn around and just go off and you end up in negative k space which is just unfeasible or infeasible okay um and that's going to be if, if you were to you know if we didn't do it last time, but uh, oops. So if you draw like starting from a high K zero, right? Um, so in this case, you um, I guess you'd probably do something like this and then oh, you turn around and then you head off also into negative infeasible space. Okay, so um, that's pretty easy to rule out. And if you, if you start here too low on the high side, on the <clears throat> high initial K, but you start too low in terms of consumption, then you're gonna turn around and head down this way. Okay, now the question is this this area over here. How do we rule that out? Okay, so that um, that we can do. Okay, because essentially using the transversality condition. Okay, so now the question is where where do we end up when we get on that weird gully there? All right, what's what's happening over there? Well, we're essentially going to the highest possible k you could imagine. All right. And what's the highest possible k you can imagine? That's where you you can you um, consume nothing, right? So basically, you're on that x-axis where c equals zero. So you consume nothing, you invest everything, all right? And you can so it's, it's a very you're producing a lot, but you're consuming none of it. So it's a weird society, okay? Um, 
in that case, all right, so remember our, our C, our K equals zero line, all right, uh, here. So the, it, it's just wherever C equals zero. So, so when C equals zero, sorry, is this, there we go. Uh, C equals zero would mean that F of K is equal to delta plus N times K, which is exactly the statement that you're putting all of your uh, consumption into counteracting depreciation to make this immense factory that you never consume the product of. All right, so so that, that right-hand side area, which, I, did I already use a hat? I already used a hat, I don't know, tilde, um, will satisfy this. Okay. All right, um, what does that mean? Okay, so now how, how do we how do we rule that? So, so what we want to do is think about R. Okay, so um, what is what is going to be the interest? So remember, the big question is is R greater than n, right? Now, remember R. I have a big problem with remembering what the definition of R is. I literally don't remember, but I looked at the slides just now, and R is equal to R, capital R minus delta. Okay, is that greater than N? That's our new question. And we're gonna rephrase this question in terms of is capital R bigger than delta plus N? Okay, so that's our, and that, that starts looking like this thing down here. That's good. Okay, maybe we can come up with some relationship. Where am I? Okay, this thing down here. All right. Um, and we also know that F prime of K, that this is true, that R capital R is equal to F prime of K of tilde, of K tilde. That's starting to look really similar. Okay. And now this thing down here, let's, let's divide. Okay, so now we have marginal product, average product. That's the only difference between these two conditions here. Right, so the, the thing on the right is true at this limiting point here where, where we impact the end of the rainbow, if you will, uh, the x-axis, all right? So the thing on the right is true. We wanna show that the thing on the right implies the thing on the left is not true, basically, all right? Um, Okay, uh, so, um, okay, let's think about F. All right, F is a concave function, all right? Uh, we have some point here, K tilde, all right? Um, F of K over K is the slope, that's the average product, right? That's the slope of the line connecting zero with F of K tilde, right? F prime of K is that marginal product, the, the derivative at that point, right? So because F is concave, F prime of K tilde, for any K, this is, oops, um, oh dear, uh, I can do this. Um, I'm gonna kind of slouch down here. Um, so for any K, and in particular for K tilde, it's gonna be true that that derivative, okay, is less than uh, the average product tilde, okay? And we know from that right-hand side equation that this is equal to delta plus n, okay? That's it, right? The second line, okay, uh, is the delta plus n is greater than that thing, f prime. And then the, the first line is that we wanted it to, to delta plus n to be less than it, okay? So what this means really is that that r if you work backwards, it just means that that R tilde is actually less than N. Okay, so the, the, the limiting, R tilde star, I don't know. The, the limiting interest rate when you go over to that point over there um, is less than N, meaning in that transversality condition, the exponential is positive, and so it, it doesn't converge to zero, it blows up, okay? So that's, that's basically, you, you can rule out all of these right-hand side paths that go off to this this um, super high level of capital by saying because they were they violate the transversality condition. 
okay? The other ones are violated from feasibility, okay? That means that the only paths that actually work are the ones on this um, line here that converges to steady state, okay? So that's it, okay, I ran out of time. Um, all right, so I guess, yeah, so I'm out of time. Uh, the, the next thing we're gonna do is talk about stability, okay? So I mean, we've kind of been dancing around stability here with thinking about are we gonna converge the saddle path and stuff. We're gonna formalize that. We're gonna formalize what does it mean to be stable, to be unstable, to have a, to be partially stable with the saddle path configuration. So we'll talk about that. It's gonna involve linearizing around steady state. So um, that's kind of cool stuff, I think. So uh, that's, that's, I guess, what we will pick up on Tuesday. I guess I'm gonna post a homework. I'm gonna post a homework like tonight or tomorrow. Okay, and then it'll be due in like a, next Tuesday. So not this coming Tuesday, but the one after that. Okay. That's the plan. All right. That's it. Watch the Mars thing. Okay. If you can, I'll see you on Tuesday. I'll see you tonight. 8 PM.